everyone. I'm so glad that you could join us today. My name is Abby Lehman and I'm with L3 Harris Geospatial. Welcome to Geospatial Distancing Weekly. Every Thursday we broadcast live with new topics and experts and we have an informal chat about all things geospatial and remote sensing as we try to keep our collective sanity during this COVID-19 lockdown. So everyone take some long nice deep breaths and remember I'm bound to get better at this eventually. Now, before we get chatty, let me introduce this week's brainy panelists. First, we have Zach Norman, who is my colleague at L3 Harris. He is coming to us remotely from his home in Broomfield, Colorado, where during lockdown, he has been enjoying long walks to the kitchen with his dog, Lark. Say hello, Zach. Hello. So Zach has an undergrad and a master's from the Colorado School of Mines. His current role uh, at L3 Harris is product management, but in his tenure, he has, he's done everything from tech support to solutions engineer and now product management. He's also one of my favorites because within weeks of his wedding, he wore a shirt to work that said, happy wife, happy life. And that tells me he's a fast learner. Now, Jamie Goodman is our second panelist this week. He is the founder and current CEO of High Speed Computing, and he joins us from his home office in Miami, Florida. Now, Jamie's just, he's just a ridiculously smart guy. He lives and breathes remote sensing, and the man probably bleeds pixels. Um, his list of credentials is lengthy, but some of the accomplishments you might not see on his official resume include raising and now temporarily homeschooling his six-year-old son, He's also taken an outrigger canoe 50 miles across the Gulf Stream from Bimini to Miami, and he's still alive. Now, his dissertation at UC Davis covered the hyperspectral remote sensing of submerged coral reefs, which technically, yes, that does make him Dr. James Goodman, although informally, he doesn't mind going by Jamie, or at least that's what he tells me. Say hello, Jamie. Thanks, Abby. Hello, everyone. Now, lastly, Every week she joins me. This is my this is my marketing colleague Matria Grazing, who joins us from her makeshift home office in Broomfield, Colorado. Say hello, Mat. Hello. Now, Matria's job during this panel discussion is to monitor your incoming questions throughout the webinar and direct them to our panel. And on that note, we invite you to submit questions at any time during the webinar. Just use the Q&A functionality, the little button you see right there along the bottom in your Zoom panel. Now that's all that's out of the way, let's jump into our panel discussion. So Jamie came to us this week and he pitched the topic of going global with regard to remote sensing. And he has some really cool imagery that he wants to share. But I'm not gonna say much more before I turn over the conversation to, to Zach and Jamie because these guys have been really nerding out uh, in the lead up to this conversation. Um, they're also very extremely experienced in their formal presentation skills, but don't worry, I'll make sure to interrupt now and then, keep them on their toes, because that's what I'm here for. <laughs> so let's go ahead. I'm gonna throw it over to uh, Zach and Jamie to begin. Thanks for the introduction, Abby. And thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, and thanks to you, Jamie, although you know, I think it'd be fun to call you Dr. Goodman, kind of like a, uh, 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 a superhero uh, name, not quite super villainy. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. And, and with your topic of uh, going global, one of the kind of uh, base ideas with some of the work that you've been doing on coral reefs. And uh, you want to start out just talking about that a little bit, and uh, we'll uh, let the conversation go from there. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, Zach. Uh, I kind of, yeah, super villain, superhero. The doctor is in, I don't know, something there. Um, yeah, so any, any excuse to talk about coral reef remote sensing, you know, I'll, I'll jump on. Um, but, you know, I, as Zach just mentioned, you know, this is kind of the concept of going from local, you know, kind of one-off studies to how do you scale that to global applications. And I thought coral reefs was a particularly interesting uh, example of that. Um, this is kind of is a, a quick a quick overview of kind of what the challenges are of this and what some current global or recent historic recent historical examples of global remote sensing of coral reefs. Um, so quickly 
coral reefs are much more challenging than imaging of the land because uh, you're looking through the water column. You've got a, a wavy water surface, you've got uh, variable water itself. In other words, the properties, the clarity of the water changes spatially. Um, and then you've got the, the depth of the water, the varying depth. So you've got all these other variables that you have to account for. So not just like having an atmospheric correction, you have to have a, a water column correction, which is like removing a super thick atmosphere and that's not easily done. Um, so there are a number of applications throughout the years of people doing one-off studies. I did, as Abby mentioned, I did one for my PhD in Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii, which is what you see up uh, behind me is my background. And taking that to a global level though, you know, we, we use hyperspectral remote sensing and getting that global though is not just like, you know, this is almost 20 years later and that's still a challenge. Um, so what has happened in that time span in those 20 years, let me do a share my screen. Yeah, we can see it. All right, All right. so there's, there's Kaneohe Bay again. Um, this this reef, has been, reef area has been studied a lot through the years. Um, about the time I was doing my dissertation, there was a project, the Millennium Coral Reef Mapping Project, which you see on the right there. And they, they kind of took the first crack at global mapping. So instead of doing, they were using Landsat, Landsat images, reefs around the world. And instead of trying to get real detailed this is where the state of the art was. It was doing a lot of manual digitization and just coming out, coming up where reefs were most likely to be. And so you can see it's kind of a crude representation, but this was state of the art 15 years ago. Uh, during that same time, at kind of a, a regional level, so within the US, uh, NOAA was running a large benthic habitat mapping program and they were using mostly aerial imagery, but they also used uh, satellite imagery. And again, there was a lot of manual, you know, human in the loop, uh, editing and digitization to get to meaningful or more meaningful, not that the original one wasn't, but more meaningful data layers of percentages of live coral and macroalgae and seagrass and that sort of thing. But that still wasn't being done globally. So people have continued to push that forward. Uh, Two projects that are going on right now, and I'll show you this example from Unia Island in Fiji. And this is the Allen Coral Atlas program, which is using planet data to map the coral reef, world's coral reefs. And you can see they're, they're using, because it's planet, they're using multispectral data. So they've got limited spectral detail, but they've got great revisit and great spatial coverage. Um, and so they're kind of doing a more simplified representation of where not just where reefs are but breaking it into more categories um, and this is this is a big step forward and then at the same time the living oceans foundation is creating their own set of maps uh, mostly in the more remote reefs of the world uh, that have a less likelihood chance of being mapped uh, but they've been traveling around by ship and doing lots of field studies so again there's still a lot of human in the loop um, and as is the Allen Coral Atlas, this is not yet automated. And so that's just to give an eye, these, all these examples were just to give an idea of where we're at is we're still looking at um, general categories of reefs. And so looking at this from a change detection standpoint, real percentages of coral, real percentages of algae and seagrass is still a future challenge that we're all working on. And I'll, I'll stop for there right now. That was just kind of to give a quick overview. It, thanks for the uh, uh, introduction and showing us some nice screenshots, Jamie. Hopefully you didn't have to go through and do any of that hand digitization. Um, I know how much of a pain that can be, um, have, doing lots of labeling for deep learning. Um, so, did, you know, here's a, a side question. Did you ever get to go and, uh, you know, unluckily have to go out in the field and uh, go uh, snorkel around or do some scuba diving at the reefs? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so Kaneohe Bay, I spent a lot of time there, um, funded uh, by NASA to do so. So I thought that was a that was a pretty good deal. Um, but yeah, you've got to you've got to do the ground truth just like anything else. It happens to be really fun ground truth, um, and yet it still is a lot of work. I mean, in and out of the water all day. You're swimming around with a clipboard and a camera, and various other things, trying to keep track of your air underwater, where your buddy is, making sure there's no sharks swimming by. I mean, it's it. 
it's fun, no doubt, but it is still work. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, good thing you made it out unscathed. Um, one of the things that you had mentioned a little bit was kind of the data processing um, and you know getting data ready for analysis. Um, and if we've got people on on the line that are familiar with remote sensing and how you know when we're working with you know pictures of land stuff that's not underwater, we gotta you know basically remove the atmosphere, correct for atmosphere um, to get to surface reflectance. Um, could you shine some some light on you know what the process looks like for um, working with water to get kind of the uh, surface reflectance of the seafloor? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, one, one thing to keep in mind at first, too, is that most of the satellite sensors that are up there, uh, whether it's free-flying satellites or the ISS, you know, most of these are, I'll call them land-optimized. The data collection is over land. The um, sensor specifications are sort of more optimized for land. Uh, water is a dark target, and that includes coral reefs, even though they show up nice and bright blue and white when we're looking at these beautiful tropical images. But you know, the real coral and algae itself is dark. Um, so you need a better sensor set sensitivity, so a better signal to noise ratio. Um, there's issues with sun glint. So that's, you know, whenever you look out on the water and you look at it at a certain angle, you see that sun literally glinting right into your eyes. Well, that can happen to the uh, satellite instruments too, where the sunlight bounces right off the water into the instrument. And there's ways of aiming the instrument properly to minimize that or avoid that as best possible. Um, and uh, as we mentioned, is removing the water column. So you get down uh, to hopefully getting benthic reflectance. So benthic is bo the bottom. And it's also because of the strong absorption of light and water, you're limited to really working in just the visible wavelengths. So you, even, even if you're working with a great big hyperspectral instrument, uh, it can help you with some of the atmospheric correction, which is a little different over water than land, but um, you end up whittling down a lot of those bands to just the visible when you're looking at mapping, classifying, monitoring uh, the bottom. So like what's the longest wavelength that you can can use and I'm sure that might vary by depth a little bit but exactly exactly I mean you in super shallow you know some people have actually been able to pick up a little bit of uh, all the way out to the near infrared but that quickly fades away so it's it's really blue green and just into the you know getting into the red mm -hmm. so even if you're using hyperspectral sensors are you um, it's primarily on the 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 visible spectrum where you have lots of bands um, with smaller spectral resolution um, rather than, you know, going from, you know, visible out to um, uh, uh, a sphere, the shortwave infrared. Yeah, it's, it's really focusing on the, the V-near sensors, so visible to near-infrared. And uh, the near-infrared is, is key, not necessarily for the bottom, but for removing things like sun glint, and then there's some other bands that are still critical for uh, the atmospheric correction. I have a question actually. Um, so, you know, you're talking about doing hyperspectral and the limits of it being able to see through the water and that kind of thing. Is this one of those opportunities for like, is it helpful to do data fusion and be able to use a few different kinds of sensors or is it hyperspectral? It's just, you just have to deal with the limits of it. Actually, I, I think that's a great question. So do you, do you use a uh, bathymetric LIDAR at all? So oh, good question. And yeah, these are good questions. So in fact, I, we just finished a study that's sort of peripheral. Well, eh, it's related to this. Um, so you, I wouldn't call, first I wouldn't call hyperspectral, I wouldn't say limitations. I'd say the cap capabilities, because you have more bands and you're able to, you know, even though you're working and just, you're limited to working in the visible, you have many more bands in the visible with which to detect these subtle features of which you can start pulling out differences between coral and algae and seagrass and rubble and that sort of thing. Now, part of doing the, the water column correction is removing the water column and bathymetry is part of that. So water depth is part of that. And I've, I've run and, and have others run studies where you use bathymetric LIDAR or some other bathymetry chart as a driver into whatever model you're doing. Uh, so instead of an unknown, and that you enter that into the model as a known, and that certainly helps as part of the data fusion. 
Um, but you get a critical question of tides, tidal state at the time of your hyperspectral image acquisition. And so if the tides are different, it's not necessarily as easy as adding a, a single smooth extra meter of water onto your bathymetry data and assuming that's constant over the whole reef area. That varies spatially too. So you can actually introduce some errors by using a um, preset bathymetry layer as input. But then the flip side is you're deriving bathymetry, water properties, and information about the bottom all out of one data set, which is so also challenging. So it's very data set and uh, data collection time of day specific. It can, it can be very much so. And we do actually have a question from the audience. Do you use fluid lensing? Oh, fluid lensing is a, a great example of some work uh, it started out of NASA Ames, um, and it, it is able to essentially remove the that variable water surface. And then any, anybody who's been out in shallow coral reefs or in their pool, and you see those bright wavy lines along the bottom, this is a technique. It's a software-based technique using the imagery. It's usually high resolution airborne imagery, but they're looking into pushing this to the satellite level. Um, and it essentially is stitching the, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, apologize to Ved on this, but uh, who, who was the creator of this, but it's, you know, taking multiple images and you pull out those non-uniformities and get a higher resolution image at the bottom. So great technology, looking forward to seeing where that goes. Well, let's uh, make sure we keep this conversation moving because we've got plenty of good things to talk about here. Um, you know, so we, we talked a little bit about kind of background and some of the, the pre-processing steps. Um, now, real quick, before we get into kind of some of the uh, uh, idiosyncrasies of maybe collecting data at, at large scales, going from, you know, looking at one coral reef to, to all coral, coral reefs, what are some of the, the products that you would be generating at, at uh, a, a site that um, you're working on? So there's kind of like multiple levels, I'd say. You know, so there's your initial level of you're getting that at surface water reflectance. You're getting a bottom reflectance. Uh, and then in deriving those, you can get uh, bathymetry, so water depth you can pull out some water properties. Uh, but then ultimately, if your goal is to then look at actual habitat composition, so coral reef composition, you're then gonna start using a, another level of analysis to pull out whether it's spectral and mixing, so looking at sub-pixel percentages of coral and algae and sand, that sort of thing, um, or actually doing classification into reef types, like some of those examples you saw were not necessarily um, Percents, they were like, here's where your coral is, here's where your rubble is, here, uh, sand, etc. Here's a question for you. Um, thinking about global scale, so you know, we've, you've got different environments and ecosystems on the surface. Um, does that change for coral reefs as well? You know, are coral reefs by Hawaii different or similar to like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia? Yeah, that's a, and that's a perfect question on the our going global. Uh, discussion topic is, you know, part of the work I had done back in my dissertation was doing spectral and mixing using the hyperspectral data. But I used spectra, field spectra that I acquired swimming around in Kaniwe Bay. So they were specific to those particular corals, that particular algae, that sand. Um, and yes, even sand has different signatures, you know, whether it's sand, mud, um, sand with algae in it, um, you know, every, everything varies, as it does on land, of course, as well. Um, now, there's some similarities among corals around the world. Um, uh, Dr. Eric Hochberg has done a lot of work on that, uh, kind of classifying similar coral types and algae types. And so you can, you can generalize to some degree, but then that is a big question on if you're trying to build a global algorithm what types of spectra do you use to represent the reefs and the algae? Um, and what some folks do is they throw multiple end members at it. So end members and spectral and mixing, those are the, the pure end members that would represent a pure coral. 
or pure al the pure algae signature, and then you see how they blend together to create a pixel. Um, and so what you would do is you do multiple end members. So you use multiple types of coral and you see mathematically which types best fit, which best recreate that pixel. So when you're doing end member matching, and since you're primarily focused on you know, visible wavelengths, um, how does, you know, what's the performance of some of the uh, you know, spectral classification algorithms? Um, you know, just thinking of things like you know, vegetation where, where the spectra can be very similar uh, until you get out into like some of the, the sphere, sphere bands where I think it's the, I can't remember it, the lignin or something absorptions that, that help delineate between like woody and, and other types of vegetation. Are there specific wavelengths or, or ranges that um, help delineate different types of coral from one another? There, well, so getting to a species level, that that is a whole, discussion on its on its own but with the spectra but it going to those general types uh, there are definitely certain bands that you can separate out a little bit that indicate you can better separate coral from algae and sand um, and that's what most of the researchers are really focused on um, one of the real challenges has actually been it's only I would say recently that we've gotten to a point where we're deriving benthic reflectance we're truly removing the, the water column a uh, number of researchers have made progress on this lately, but you know, back again, ba you know, back to my dissertation days, I used a workaround where I was taking my benthic, my my spectral end members, and I was pretending I project them through the water column, so what they would look like at the water surface, and then use that to drive an unmixing. Um, so I wasn't actually re directly removing the water column. It was a workaround, and it was because actually inverting all these physical equations to go from surface reflectance to bottom reflectance, um, work in progress then, and still to some degree a work in progress now. I have a question. Jamie, is your car entire career just one big ploy to get paid to go scuba diving? Because I feel like it is. <laughs> It's, you know, it, it, yeah, I, I'd love it to be. Is it not a bad career? Not, 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 a, ba not a bad thing. Yeah. It's not all I do, though. It's all fairness of rep fully representing high-speed computing. We do a lot of other work, too. Uh, most, of it, most of it's on land, but uh, we, do a lot, we also do stuff in water, and we're still involved in the core reef work. Didn't mean to interrupt you there, Zach. I just felt like I needed to ask that question. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, so, so here's another question for you, Jamie. So, you know, with the context of, of going global, what are some of the challenges that you think about collecting data over large scales? Um, you know, you might have different sensors, I don't know, different wavelengths, different signal to noise ratio. Um, you know, what, what, what do you see as potentially some of the barriers of if you want to actually collect imagery over all of the world's, you know, coral reefs, you know, what, what, what might you run into? So going back to the, like the Millennium Coral Reef Mapping Project that was using Landsat data, they had found, this goes back to the, also the, the, the land optimized sensors. So it's not land optimized just in the sensor specifications, it's where they're actually acquiring imagery. Um, so Landsat wasn't acquiring imagery over all the coral, world's coral reefs. So as part of that project, they actually talked with NASA and USGS and tasked, specifically tasked Landsat to pick up some other areas of the world that weren't being collected. So, you know, even then, and this isn't that long ago, it was intentionally collecting that imagery, you know, was, a, was, a, was the first challenge. Um, now you move forward and you know, through the, the Allen Coral Atlas project, they're, you know, they're using planet imagery. And that is collecting, but, you know, around the world. But again, they're not necessarily, they're not collecting the whole open ocean, right? You know, so there's, now we don't necessarily want to, but um, for this application, but you do have to target all the coral reefs and you have to specifically call those out because some of those are just large, shallow ocean areas where there are reefs but you might not have otherwise selected. Um, and then if we start looking at hyperspectral and you start looking at the volume, um, which, I, which I think you can speak to, uh, Zach, on the, the volume of hyperspectral, but just to point out that 
from a acquisition standpoint, like DSIS, which is on the, the DSIS hyperspectral sensor on the International Space Station, that is still a targeted sensor. So it's not a global mapper. It's not picking up all coral reefs and we could just go back into its archive and start pulling everything out and analyzing it. You have to, we have to tell them. And of course, not just tell them, this is you know, a research slash commercial venture. So you know, you're gonna have some funding to make this happen. I don't know. I have I have an in on Desis. I'm just saying, if you want. I mean, one of our other guests uh, happens to know a lot about it. I'm just saying. Shout out to Amanda O'Connor. Yeah, I'm ho hoping to get to work with some of that imagery. Actually, yes. Thank you, Amanda. We know exactly who to talk to. Um, but and then NASA NASA is uh, has in the plans right now uh, the SBG instrument, which they are figuring out the details of the architecture. Um, it's an ongoing process, but indications are that it will be a hyperspectral instrument. And that's, so that's a near future NASA project that will be global in the sense that it's, it's still land optimized, but I'm, I'm sure, you know, my, my guess is that it will also be including things like the shallow reef areas. So let me share my desktop here real quick. I have a one slide, maybe two, just to show. And this is actually from a presentation that we did together um, a couple of years ago, Jamie, if you remember at the EAS, the MV Analytics Symposium. Um, and just to I'll let this play through a few times, and since this is Zoom, hopefully the animation is showing pretty well. Um, talk, it, you know, one of the challenges that, that I, I find interesting about you know, large volumes of data is, is kind of talking about <clears throat> resolution and actual size. So I can't remember the area in like square kilometers, square meters uh, of the scene that's actually shown here on this, but it goes through for eight different frames um, with different pixel sizes and meters. And you can see how that, you know, some of the dramatic differences between, um, you know, the file size um, at different you know, spatial resolutions. Um, and this data set in particular was just four bands of data. Um, and so, you know, if you had, you know, 80 bands, you'd be multiplying these file sizes by 20. Um, and so, you know, if you want to collect hyperspectral data over, you know, large areas, you, you have lots of, lots of data volume challenges. Um, and you got to figure out where to host that or how to get that to people. Um, and, you know, like uh, sensors, you know, we, we talked a little bit about this, Jamie, is, you know, challenges with making sure that sensors are consistent. You know, if you have two separate hyperspectral sensors, they might have their own idiosyncrasies or different signal to noise ratios, or, you know, just the, the visual representation of the products can look a little bit different and, and you know, could potentially throw off um, any analysis that you might do. Um, so, you know, th this is something that, you know, I think, you know, bigger than, you know, kind of our topic here is, you know, data size is really important. One of the things that's also kind of important here is, you know, if we're talking about processing global volumes of data, which I know you've done a little bit of this for, for enterprise processing, Jamie, um, is as you have higher and higher resolution, you have more data and the time it will take to process your data will, will scale with that as well. And so trying to find a, a optimal, you know, resolution that gets you the answers you need that'll also process you know, quickly, you know, there, there's a lot of you know, kind of knobs you can turn, I guess, to, to um, you know, fine tune processing, especially if you're doing some of this stuff at scale. Yeah, and, and so that brings up a, a question, Zach, that I'll throw back towards you on, you know, 20 years ago, if someone said, let's do global mapping, auto automated, be, I, you would be aghast that you'd be thinking what large data center can I get to host my process? Um, but you could probably speak to, you know, what is available now that, you know, what, what kind of tools are out there now that we can, we actually can consider doing this. This is conceivable, it's being done. Yeah, sure, and, and you know, primary tools are just, you know, cloud hosted infrastructure, you know, whether it's Google or Azure or AWS, um, you know, just some, some tools for, and terms for people that, you know, might not be aware. So like when we do, um, cloud processing, we use uh, Kubernetes to auto scale. So basically is if, if you were going to, 
process the whole globe. And there's, there's lots of ways that you could go about doing this, but like, so Kubernetes, if you, you have this big old job queue of everything that needs to get done. And as that queue starts growing, you can scale up the number of, of instances of, you know, something that goes through and process that data. So if you had, you know, maybe a, a hundred thousand, you know, scenes that you need to process to, that cover the whole world, you could, you know, theoretically stand up, you know, 10,000 uh, or, you know, instances to go through and process each, you know, 10 scenes or something like that. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of cool stuff. Some, some of the interesting parts I'd say about enterprise processing are, are just the, the cost. Um, you know, it's, it, it's not cheap to get into to say the least, but you know, some of the benefits are, are really that scalable infrastructure. So, you know, it's hard to uh, make local servers scale up as needed, but you know, when, if you're up in the cloud, you can just spin things up as much as you want. Um, and, you know, costs are, are definitely something to consider about this, uh, you know, especially with data storage and data access. And, and there's some very uh, uh, interesting little kind of hidden costs uh, when working in the cloud, like, uh, special mounted drives or, or if you're working with cloud native storage like blob or S3, you know, the number of operations that you have to write um, or, or get information, pull things down, you know, you, you get charged based on volume. Um, and so kind of a, a separate and, and probably more detailed than anybody cares about right now since we're talking about remote sensing, but a, a, a separate thing to optimize this is your, you've got your data size which is going to directly affect your cost, which will directly affect how long it takes to process, which also directly affects your cost. And then the actual outputs and products and how you store those is also going to directly affect your cost. So there's lots of things to take into account. And sometimes you just got to, you got to get started and jump in and start small and figure out what your costs are and, and where you can optimize to, to reduce those. Um, but you know, the, that's also a whole other conversation, um, but something that um, I've been working on a, a project that, uh, lately where we've been going through and, and optimized and significantly reducing the amount of cost um, it takes to, to run some of our analytics in the cloud, um, just because of some of those, those hidden um, costs that aren't, aren't apparent until you start doing things at scale. Yeah, and then there's that interesting question of, are you trying to do a routine monitoring or are you, you're looking at producing a one one time period global map or regional map of something, you know, or or you know flip flop. So for, you know, going back to the coral reefs, if we're trying to monitor their relative health, then we need to be mapping them routinely. Yep. And so then all, all those topics you just discussed, you start multiplying by every time you want to have a new data collect. And, and that, you know, if you're doing stuff over time, that's where it also gets really important that your sensors are consistent, you know, because you want to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. And if you have, uh, you know, if, if your calibration is off and you're, and you're doing, you know, processing based on, you know, pixel values rather than, you know, some, some normalized threshold that might be a little bit more insensitive. I mean, you, you know, you could get, you know, very different results um, from, from time one to time two or time two to time three based on, um, you know, your sensor and, and sensor characteristics. Yeah. I, I mean, and I still think, as I know you do as well, is it's exciting though that these are all even in our discussion. These are in our realm of possibility right now. Yes, there are costs that we have to consider, but we can do these things that before just weren't even a possibility. Yeah, and, it, and it's, you know, cloud processing and scaling, you know, it's not rocket science, there's, there's tons of tools out there and plenty of, of different little, you know, startups and, and smaller, you know, small sat uh, remote sensing companies and lots of people are doing this and succeeding and, you know, it's something that uh, if you invest the time, you know, you can, you can, you can get up and running and do this as well. You know, as we're, as we're talking about just, you know, the realm of possibility and the fact that we can actually do these kinds of things now, um, you know, I hate to be Debbie Downer, but bring it back to the COVID thing again. This is kind of just a question I'm really, you know, posing to all the experts every week. Um, you know, what is even possible when it comes to tracking something like that? I know, you know, I talked to Jamie this week about, um, 
you know, what can you actually see? You know, coral reefs, obviously, they regenerate at a rate that's, that's too slow. Well, he told me that, so now I know that, um, to be able to track. But, um, you know, we were talking about looking at shipping traffic. He's in Miami. I mean, what's the difference when you look at something like that? Yeah, I mean, there's the, the aspect that I think anybody who's been following the geospatial media on, you know, remote sensing, uh, how the world has changed, you know, just showing em empty plazas, you know, these uh, international historic landmarks where they're just empty um, shipping areas, like the Venice, and I'm sure, you know, I haven't been out on the water in Miami, unfortunately, lately, but, um, they're empty of boats. You know, there's still, I'm sure, large-scale shipping traffic, uh, but, you know, the personal craft are, are gone. Um, so you've got major differences there. Uh, but, that, you know, that's kind of like tracking the human influence. How does that impact the environment? Um, I, think, I think there was some discussion a couple weeks ago on this on remote sensing and, and tracking COVID would be more tying together larger scale models of, you know, maybe not this one in particular, but disease pandemics in general, are there environmental drivers where you can pick out whether it's the, you know, actual environment, uh, dry, wet, you know, forested, unforested, or recently deforested, um, as is the case with some mosquito borne diseases. Um, is there a weather aspect to it? I know there was some early, you know, indication that maybe COVID was not, it did not as, do as well in warm weather. I know that's controversial, but like there was some indication there that, so at least from a tracking standpoint, if there is a disease where that is, you can show that, you can start using that's weather, you know, you can start bringing in your weather tracking, you know, maybe something's more acclimated to weather conditions and, you know, tying that all together. I, you know, just from a modeling standpoint, an active spread standpoint, um, that sort of thing. Uh, I heard you say that you obviously, you said obviously haven't been in the water uh, around Miami lately. So does social distancing in Florida include scuba diving? Are you allowed to do that? Do they have a specific outline? <laughs> I think the question is getting in the water. I, I think I think the national media, if not the international media, for anybody out there, you can you can tell me. But Florida, we got uh, pretty much lambasted for the spring breakers out partying on the beaches and partying on their boats at the sandbars after we were all supposed to be doing social distancing. Um, and so they, for a while, they were saying, "Yeah, social distancing. You're out on a boat. We'll let you do that." So they had all the boat ramps open, and then they specifically shut down all the boat ramps because people weren't playing nice. Uh, so if, if you happen to live on the water, you have a boat in your backyard, I don't think there's any restrictions about going out. So if you know somebody, know. anybody from Miami watching, I'd love to go out. Good to know. Good to know. You know, uh, we're coming up on our, we've actually been talking for a little while here. So, um, I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap up actually, unless, uh, you guys have anything else that you're just dying to say. Zach, I know you're dying to say something. Yeah, I, I, I always just love talking. So, you know, I could, I could, we could probably go on for a couple hours if people are really interested. Well. The hint of sarcasm there. <laughs> okay, so I'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, I'll go like one, a couple. Yeah. A couple quick, just last, last thoughts. Um, you know, Taking stuff global is, you know, not just the algorithms and the data acquisition. It's, you know, how much do you want a human in the loop? You know, we, we're incredible. All of us are incredible with what we can do with our brains. And where do you put that human in the loop? How much can you automate? How much can you start bringing machine learning into all of this? You know, at what level do you step in? These are all great questions. Uh, we're going to see more of this in the future. Um, and I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't give a quick shout out to map box for the background uh, using some of their tools. This is, we didn't get into this, but how, how do you display and transmit your results and the data to the general public? And there are amazing tools that are coming out for us to be able to do that. Awesome. Thanks, Jamie. So I just want to thank you guys both. Um, these guys were ridiculously prepared for this. Um, 
they always are. I can always count on both of them for that. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you to our audience for tuning in live this week. Remember, we go live every Thursday with new topics and new panelists. I have a few repeat customers, but you know, we have our favorites. What can I say? Next week, we're going to be joined uh, by drone pilot and podcaster Jason Sansusi from Juniper Unmanned. Um, and once again, as I said, repeat customer, we're going to be bringing back my colleague Austin Coates um, so that they can nerd out about all things UAV data related. So now uh, to get more details about that uh, and get the join information and also to look at the recording from this week's webinar. Just go ahead out here. You're going to go and visit our harrisgeospatial.com slash webinars page. And there you will find, along with our other very nice and more formal webinars, um, the recorded episodes and the information to join live in the future. So until then, just want to say stay grateful for your friends and family right now and do it by staying the hell away from them. To love is to distance right now, people. To love is to distance. I'll see you guys next week.